And in this message, I hope to answer the question, uh, what are we going to be getting closer to? Uh, why uh, does it matter? And uh, what are we individually uh, going to do about it? All right. So what's getting closer? Uh, why does it matter? And what are we all going to do about it? If I do my job well, uh, you will not leave with those questions unanswered. Okay. So let's take a moment and pray. Father, I just want to uh, say uh, to you that uh, me doing what I'm called to do well is so entirely dependent upon you that uh, I just invite your Holy Spirit to come and stir fresh faith and fresh fervency in the hearts of your people. Jesus, we know that this is all about you and for you and for your glory and for your purposes and for your kingdom. And we present ourselves afresh as living sacrifices, praying that our lives would be holy and acceptable to you. This is so reasonable that we should offer this to you in view of all that you have done for us and, and given to us. So we uh, pray that you would bind our hearts together in love for one another and love for you and that uh, great days of uh, advancement for your kingdom of moving forward together for our church would be uh, the outcome of what we begin uh, today. And uh, so we yield our hearts and minds to those purposes and your Holy Spirit's leadership in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would uh, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, we think four letters to the Corinthians. Two of them are referenced, but we don't have them. So we'd have to guess those weren't inspired by the Holy Spirit. Everything that Paul wrote wasn't inspired by the Holy Spirit. But some of the things that he did are, are Scripture, and they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Two of those letters to the Corinthians are Scripture, and you have them there in your Bible. This is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. And um, as you're turning there, I want to draw your attention to a couple of Scripture references, and I want to read them to you. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, if you uh, know your Bible well, you'll know that uh, Matthew 24 and 25 is known as the Olivet uh, Discourse. And in Matthew 25, uh, 13, uh, Jesus said this uh, to the disciples as he was teaching them. He said, watch therefore... For you know neither the day nor the hour. Again, Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day uh, nor uh, the hour. Now, the day that he's referring to here is a day uh, somewhere up ahead uh, on the calendar. I don't know uh, how many days ahead the day is, but the day is such an important day that all other days in human history will seem like nothing by comparison. I have in my office back in the 80s and early 90s, we used to keep track of our calendar by uh, something called a day timer. That seems nearly prehistoric now because we cast that. How many people used to have a day timer? All right. And you write down your dates, you write down your things, you physically write them down, like take a, what are, the, what are those things that make marks called? Pens, right? Pens. You take a pen and you write down your dates in your day timer, and then you'd have to have different things and fill up this binder. And then we got super smart, and uh, that uh, little uh, office complex at the corner of 90 and 53, where it becomes 290, was owned by a company that uh, made something that people began to carry around, something electronic. Does anyone remember what that was called? A Palm Pilot. Now, this is just absolutely... Rev Hands up if you had a Palm Pilot. I'm so, so sorry for the money that you <laughs> wasted on that. That seemed like that would be a forever idea. They built a building over there like it was going to be there forever, and it seems like it was only there for maybe 10 minutes after their headquarters was finished because of a guy named Steve Jobs. And, and we all decided that uh, music and... Uh, a phone and calendar and everything, of course, should all come together. Now, regardless of how you keep track of the days, the Bible says, that are yet unwritten for you, I can promise you that when Matthew 25, 13 says, watch, 
therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour, the day that's being referenced there, let me show it to you again. You don't have to turn to this, but I'll just kind of do the hard work. I'm making my way to 1 Corinthians 3 where I'm going to meet you in a moment. But in Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 17, verse 30, it says, On that day, let the one who was on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down. He's talking about this day, this day that's circled, should be circled in red on our calendars coming up ahead. I could go on and on and on about the day and show it to you many, 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 many times in the New Testament. The day, the day, the day, the day, the day. Paul said to Timothy, I know whom I've believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until the day. Paul said in the last minutes of his life in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 4, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown the right, uh, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that, say it, day, and not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. Sometimes we're so focused on today, or worse, on yesterday, that we lose sight of the day. There's only one day that matters. And it isn't yesterday, and so far it isn't today, but it might be tomorrow. And the day, the day, the day, the only day that really matters is racing upon us. Now, it's interesting. Jesus, Paul, Peter, John, the writer of Hebrews, all refer to that day Every apostle was working for that day, and every Christian needs to be mindful of what the Bible calls the day of Jesus Christ, or the day of the Lord. Now, precisely, it's not the rapture, it's not the second coming, it's not the great white throne judgment from which all will be banished to the lake of fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, remember said I would meet you there, should have turned there, there now, are you? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, let me read it, down through verse 15. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds upon the foundation, what's the foundation again? Jesus. Come on, what's the foundation? Jesus. Oh, how many are there? One. There's only one foundation, it's Jesus Christ. Now, lots of people don't build on that. Most people don't build on that. Only a few build on it. But among the few who build on it, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for, say it, the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation, what's the foundation again? And if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. Make a note of this. Our greatest motivation is the day. This is the thing that kept Paul on track when he was beaten, when he was stoned, when he was left for dead. When he was overnight in the deep, he says, when he was shipwrecked on Malta, when he was in prison, falsely accused, and in the moments before he made the ultimate sacrifice and gave his life instead of denying Jesus Christ, Paul was fixed on one thing, the day of Jesus Christ. Now, biblically speaking, if you want to just kind of get these uh, concentric circles in your mind, what are we talking about when we're talking about the day of Jesus Christ? The subject is, first of all, I would say um, end times, future things, what's up ahead. But if you narrow the circle a little bit, I would say that inside that, we're talking about the second coming of Christ without getting into the breaking down of the rapture and the returning with the saints. If you want to get a little bit more narrow, we're talking in 1 Corinthians 3 about the bema. If you don't know that word, I'll talk 
to you about it in a moment, but the bema is translated the judgment seat in the New Testament. One little four letter word is translated judgment seat, which has caused some real confusion. And if you want to get to the center of what this message is about, it's about you and whether you're going to be in a good place when the day comes. All right. So that's what we have in mind. Now, let me just kind of buzz through here from the text that I just read. I'm going to give you 10 before we're done. But here's the first five. All in favor of learning some things in church. All right, here it comes. Here it comes. Five facts about the judgment seat of Christ. What's being referenced here. And I'll show you some other passages. Uh, number one, the judgment seat of Christ is for all Christians. If you have turned from your sin and embraced Jesus Christ by faith, notice it in the text. If anyone builds on the foundation, which we understand is Christ, um, it says in verse 15, if anyone's, everyone's going to be involved in this. This is for all Christians. Secondly, um, this is an individual, an individual appearance before Jesus Christ. Notice in the text, each one's work, each one, the work each one has done, he will receive a reward. He himself will be saved. This is an individual thing. Your mom's not going to the judgment seat of Christ with you. Your spouse isn't going to the judgment seat of Christ with you. Your best disciple isn't going to the, the judgment seat of Christ with you. Your kids that you've invested so much in, they're not going. You're going by yourself. Now, I don't know if there's going to be a crowd looking on. I don't know if the person next in line is going to be standing behind you. I can just tell you that nobody's going to be talking about what anyone else did. Everyone's going to be anticipating the moment when his gaze falls upon your eyes and your face to face with Jesus Christ. That's what happens on the day. And if you begin to grasp that in any sense, what he said or she did or I thought, all of that is going to fade fast into just this. It's for all Christians and you're going to be there on your own. All in favor of some good news? It's not about condemnation. The judgment seat of Christ is not about, it is serious, but it is not about condemnation. Of course, Romans 8, 1 says that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just back one page to the left, Paul says, so that you're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you till the end, guiltless in the day, there it is again, the day, say the day. Amen. Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your appearance before Jesus Christ is not going to be about your sin, not going to be about your failure, not going to be about those things of which you are ashamed, not at all, not even going to come up. Why? Because all of our sins have been placed upon Christ on the cross. Now, if that causes you to think that it's going to be an easy appointment, I want you to know it isn't. It's not going to be about the wrong things that we have done. It is going to be about the good that we have left undone. It is going to be about the opportunity that was presented to us in this short thing called life, the gifts that were given to us, the opportunity that was given to us, the place that we were put, the things that were in front of us, and what we did with our opportunity. That's it. You're going to stand before Jesus Christ and he's going to be, I gave you this much time. I gave you this much teaching. I gave you my Holy Spirit. I put these needy people around you. What did you do with what I gave you? That's the judgment seat of Christ. It's not about condemnation. It's all about rewards. It's all about rewards. I hope to take this trip again someday. Years ago, Kathy and I were with a group of believers in Corinth. And here's an actual picture. They found through archaeology an actual bema. It wasn't really a court of law per se. In fact, the bema was taken from the Isthmian Games. And uh, 
the uh, judges, so to speak, would sit up in this elevated area and they would watch athletes compete and they would make sure that they competed according to the rules. And then at the end of the competition, the race or the throwing or whatever was the competition, they would call forward the victor and they would place a laurel wreath around their brow and they would publicly honor them and reward them for their work. That's what the judgment seat is about. It is an opportunity to answer for what you've done with what you've been given and a chance to be imagine. A chance to be rewarded by Jesus Christ personally. It's all about these rewards. And notice, our work will be tested by fire. Do you see that in the text? And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. It's some kind of refining. It's some kind of burning away of that which was less important, poorly motivated, inconsistently pursued. There will be a purification Listen, look up here. The totality of our efforts, actually or metaphorically, we don't know, but it won't matter. The totality of our efforts will go through some kind of momentary, nearly instantaneous, public refining so that only what is pure, only what is true, only what is right will remain. There won't be any posing, there won't be any posturing, there won't be any showing off, there won't be any playing the part, there only won't, won't be any for myself, my reputation, my glory. All of that will be instantaneously incinerated and only what was truly for Jesus Christ will remain. Then based on that, we'll receive a reward. So it's our... <laughs> No wonder, no matter what Paul was going through, he'd be like, it's for the day. It's for the day. I'm just thinking about, Paul, how are you doing this? How are you still going? How, how come you don't quit? Well, because there's a day coming. Notice this. It's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Joel chapter 2 talks about the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Joel 2, 31 and 32. Boy, there's been so many days in human history, hasn't there? Days when people seemed that they could go on unchecked forever. And that wrong would prevail. And that right would fail. Adolf Hitler had his day. Joseph Stalin had his day. Think of insert name of serial killer had his day. Some would say this is the day of Donald Trump. Some would say this is the day of evangelical scandal. So many days come and go. But listen, soon, hear me? Soon, the sky is going to break open and the thunder is going to clap and the clouds are going to depart and Jesus Christ is going to descend on a white horse with a sword going out of his mouth with which he will strike the nations and his children are going to have appeared before him and given account for themselves on that day. What a day that will be. Amen. What Jesus Christ wants will happen. On time, every time. Amen. Now, this week, some things have happened that Jesus Christ would not have preferred. And this month, and this year, and this decade, and this century, the teeming mountains of things that have happened because of sin and not just out there, but point to where else. 
that Jesus Christ would not have preferred. But when the day comes, there will be no more of those days. Never again. We're going to see how he has been, as he promised, working all things together for the good of those who love him. Five more facts about the judgment seat of Christ. Before I give you these facts, let me just read two more passages. If you're taking good notes, as some of you I know like to do, the 1 Corinthians 3, along with Romans 14, 10. There's three main passages that talk about this. 1 Corinthians 3, Romans 14, 10 says, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Were you doing that this week? Why are you doing that? Why do you despise your brother? Were you doing that this week? I can't believe she said that. I can't believe he can act like that. How many cycles wasted on that? Why are we doing that? Romans 14, 10. We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. And then into 2 Corinthians, so we've looked at every passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There it is, Bema. So that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. You say, well, I thought there wasn't going to be any sin there. Right. You're going to receive for the good or you're going to not receive for the evil of the good left undone. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. So here they come, five more facts about the judgment seat of Christ. How about this? It's going to be face to face. It's going to be face to face. Faces are so great. You knew I was going to find a way to work Landon's new baby into the message. How many people knew that was coming? So that's Landon's new little baby, born beautifully to he and Bree yesterday, their third, our eighth grandchild. We're really good at grandsons. We're six and two on boys. And, uh, but so grateful for Julian River. Wait till you hear Landon's explanation of the river in Ezekiel. Wow. Julian River McDonald. Kathy and I saw him last night. We were over to the hospital late, but then we had to get up this morning and get on FaceTime. And uh, so there we are, looking at him again. That's after he just had come back from, from his, you know, that little surgical procedure that they do. <laughs> I, would, I would have you note that he had it, Paul had it done on the eighth day. He already has it done. Just saying, just saying. I'm so thankful for your faces, but how will our joy in the faces of our, of our loved ones, in the faces of one another, how will those experiences fade? When we are face to face with Jesus Christ. I need you, I need you to think about that for a minute. It's coming. And it's getting a lot closer. Notice, seventh, notice it's mandatory. Like, I don't know if I'm going to go. You're going. <laughs> well, you know, I've said this for years. I, you know, I'm not really much for speeches. I'm going to, yeah, you're going to make one then. Well, I let other people do the talking. I hardly, we go out for dinner with four or five people. I don't say a word. I just listen. You'll be talking then. Trust me when I tell you, you're going to make a speech. I hope you'll have something to say. In the scriptures I just read you, it says, for we all must appear. Now, if Almighty God inspired the Holy Spirit through Paul to put in his word, must appear. Which one of those words is confusing you? 
Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you're going. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ here at church this week, and if you're not, I'd, I'd turn from my sin and embrace Christ by faith now. He loves you. He'll forgive you. It will change everything. If you don't, that's a whole different message. Not great. Face to face, mandatory. And then we're going to account. We're going to explain. That's what it means. You're going to explain. But why didn't you? But you knew. But it was taught to you. But you weren't lacking understanding. Why so little interest in the kingdom of God? Was God a wilderness for you? Did you find that the more that you knew him, the less that you thought of him? Why the doubt? Produce your strong reasons. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Notice face to face mandatory. We're going to have to account or explain. The primary subject at the judgment seat of Christ is going to be our treatment of other Christians. Number one thing. Go read the passages that talk about the Bema and see how, why do you judge your brother? We will all appear. Why do you despise your brother? We will all appear. And as we've been learning in our Vertical Living series, this matter of how we treat our brothers and sisters is so important to the Lord. Finally, just notice with me quickly, I'll read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There's going to be many surprises. If you're sitting in church and you're like, man, I'd like to go right now. I mean, this is going to be so amazing. What's going to happen here is going to be so incredible. And I just literally cannot wait. I meant to say 1 Corinthians 4, forgive me. I'm trying to lose you a little bit, just throw you off the trail. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Well, backing up a bit, it says, to me it is a very, listen, to me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. Why, Paul? Because he who judges me is the Lord. It isn't that your opinion doesn't matter. It's just that the totality of human opinion is nothing compared to the Lord's opinion. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. For the time will come when the Lord will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. There's going to be a lot of surprises. If you're sitting here going, I, I am so excited about this. I mean, literally, I just cannot wait for Jesus Christ to give me my reward. Uh, you might want to rethink that. I'm not saying it won't be grace-filled. I'm just saying, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I'm saying, take a good look. What are you doing for the Lord? And why are you doing it? And with what attitude are we doing it? These are the things that I believe are going to be significant. In fact, jot this down. It is the day of Christ's judgment. I'm back for the rest of the message now in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And notice verse 12, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, okay, that is small, beautiful, valuable, hard to obtain. Look up here. The things that I've done, the things that you've done for the Lord that are small, beautiful, valuable, hard to obtain, that's the imagery of Gold, silver, precious stones. What about all the things that we've done for the Lord that are wood and hay and straw? You know, bulky, ugly, cheap, easy to obtain. And then the flame. 
What will happen to the gold and silver and precious stones when the flame hits it? Not a thing. And what will happen to the wood, hay, and stubble when the flame hits it? Come on, everyone do it. And all God's people said... Good works are not the source of new life in Christ. They're not, they're not salvation. Good works are not the source of salvation, but they are the sign of it. Do you see? If there's no result of your confession of Christ, if it doesn't result in a desire to serve Christ, if it doesn't result in that, notice in the text it says that the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Some work is of such a beautiful, valuable, well-motivated, Christ-honoring sort. And some work is of a... Now, let me just say, after all these many years, it's interesting, even those who seem to be doing it for such wonderful reasons, watch how they respond when they don't get to do it anymore. Not how joyful are they when they hold their position of influence and ministry, but how Christ adoring and scripture elevating and others preferring are they when they lose the opportunity to do the thing that they had done. So it's what we do, it's why we do it, and it's how we do it. Then this. It's a day of rewards. A little more on the rewards. Verse 14 says, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, that's that's crazy, right? If, everyone say it. If, If, so, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe this is gonna be a huge bonfire. You know, one person's gonna slip out with a single earring or something, right? If, so in many instances, nothing will survive, but if it survives, he or he or she, the individual, will receive a reward. I think the reward is for faithfulness, for fruitfulness, for sacrifice, for perseverance, for right motives for doing the hard thing, for doing the unpopular thing, for continuing doing it. I always thought it was a little strange anyway. I mean, we're gonna get crowns and stuff, right? And then what do we do with our crowns as soon as we get them? We get to throw them at Jesus' feet. So it's gonna be like, how long did you have your reward? Yeah, no, three seconds, uh, two and a half seconds. But how terrible is it going to be to have nothing to lay there? To think that the totality of my life would go up in flames because the little that I did or the lot that I did was so wrongly motivated and so selfishly prioritized and so all about me and so little about him. A good test of who it's about is how you respond when it's taken from you how you respond when it costs you, how you respond when it's not appreciated or recognized, how you respond when it's refused. I tried so hard to love them and they just refused. I get it. But therein lies the test. Who is it really for? And is he still everything that he's promised to be? And is the message still true? And is the response to accept or reject, does that lie within me or does that lie within the other? So finally this, the day is getting closer. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Saved as one snatched out of the fire, saved by the skin of my teeth, empty-handed into heaven, nothing to say thank you for saving me. 
looking to the future and wondering how many more years the Lord will give. There is what is seen and there is what is unseen. There is what is known and there is what is unknown. There is what people who talk say and there is what people who know the biblical mandates about silence don't say. We're told that Jesus Christ, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Come on, when's that going to happen? It's going to happen on the day. And the day is getting closer, so much closer. Note this. I've always loved this sentence. And I do have this little problem with the Internet. I just want to say this. There are things that I have said so often that if you go online and you Google it, it says that I said it. (laughs) And I feel a little dissonance about that. For example, I've been saying for years that gratitude is the attitude that sets the altitude for living. But I didn't say that. I don't know where that came from. I've been saying it for so long. If you sign on the Internet, you've got to go through 200 pages of Google to even find someone who's said it. But that's not original with me. Here's another one. And I I looked all over for who said this, and I can only find me. (laughs) But I didn't really make this up. But I love this sentence. Every day, we pitch our tents one day's march closer to eternity. Every day. Every day. And little Julian's just getting started. And some of us have been doing this for quite some time. And others of you have been doing this for a long, long, long time. And the day, spiritually speaking, certainly on your time line, is getting closer. 